Welcome back. Now, it's what everybody is talking about. Emmanuel Ajafo Abugri and his colleague were picked up last Thursday by national security operatives on claims that they had engaged in cybercrime, a claim that the media outfit denies vehemently. Emmanuel Ajafo Abugri told Joy News in an exclusive interview that he was subjected to all kinds of torture, including electric shocks during his detention. Now, he's been speaking with my colleague, MFA Apu. Every person came with a slap, heavy slap. So when they ask a person before I could say Jack, then they slap. And sometimes when I speak and they are not uh, too convinced uh, with my answer, they give me a slap. And then from there, they torture me. They use the, the, the electric shocker mm. to shock my body. And then even to the extent they even shock my ears with a shocker. After which they put a handcuff on my hands behind. And then they were giving me punches and all that. And from there, they made me they made me go to the military style, where I have to lean against a, a wall with my legs up, with my hands down, as if I'm doing a pepper. Mm. Then they gave me a huge slap on my back. Then I fell. Then um, one guy used his elbow, and then straight on my backbone. He hit it, and I fell down. I, I lost breath for a while, so I had to open my mouth and gush in air, mm -hmm. so I could survive. And I cried like a newborn baby. <laughs> That I am innocent. I don't know the Kwab, the, the constant Kwaben guy. And then the second story uh, was actually a press release which we published. Mm. So after all this torturing, when finally were you released, and and how did that happen? So so actually actually they took me on Thursday and they released me on Saturday morning. And so on Saturday morning I was there, and then um, um, I was there, and then they came and called me that look, uh, they have to release me to go. They have to bail me to go. So they gave me my shoe, my belt. My, you know, they took my phones, they took my two phones, my tablet, and my laptop. So they, so when we got there, they took, I, they collected the password. So I gave my phones to them and all that. So after going through, they didn't see anything. Then when they were releasing me, they gave me the phones and my tablet. But my laptop is still with them as we speak now. But you are accused of hacking into systems of corporate bodies and your when, competitors. When is they that were the case? Me, mm -hmm. When they were interrogating me, those issues of hacking never pop up. Okay. Now, 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 if they if they are, if, now, if they are saying that I hacked into their system, when they came to my office and read it, what communication gadget did they pick? And when they went through my, my laptop and my phones, which, what, which so, uh, hacking software did they see? And which corporate email or corporate organization did we hack? Okay. I, do, are, are they not supposed to be told those organizations? Are, are they not entitled to know? So that they can also do checks from their side to find out that indeed somebody tried tempering with their system and then they can also come up with their, of their findings and also uh, do proceed further. Okay. No, I don't have an IT background. So as it stands now, are you supposed to report back uh, to the National Security or I'm the BNI? I'm on my way. I'm on my way. I'm supposed to report in the morning, but I wasn't feeling well. I had to take my medicine. And as it stands now, are you getting any medical attention? Have you reported yes, to the... I immediately when they released me, immediately I had to go to... A hospital, yes, because I was suffering. Now, already there are reactions on this. Let's first hear from the executive director of the Media Foundation for West Africa, Suleiman Abraima, who says government must respect the human rights of the two journalists and ensure the rule of law is followed if they have erred. He, however, adds the claims of torture would worsen Ghana's already blighted press freedom credentials. Into a, a situation where it's about rule of force and not rule of law. Um, I, think, I think that it must be embarrassing for the government for this to have happened. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I can't contemplate what would justify the nature and manner in which we've heard these people were picked up and now we are hearing uh, that they were tortured. I think, as I said earlier, it's something that is deeply embarrassing for our country. Um, those of us within this space I've received several calls from the international community. Um, some of them saying, we've read this about Ghana, but we don't believe this could happen in Ghana. Can you confirm it for us? You know, and, and so I think government must immediately take steps to ensure that, yes, if these people have committed any um, offense or any crime, um, they are handled in accordance with the law and not uh, on the basis of who has power and who can teach anybody um, a lesson on the basis of deploying national security um, to do what we are told um, happened. Again, the worrying phenomenon is that from Iowa, so West Wogan and so on and so forth, uh, our national security establishment
perhaps is is has reputational issues to deal with and so on the basis of that these are the kinds of things that you wouldn't want them to um, be getting themselves meddled in or involved um, in so um, the folks should be handled in accordance with the law their rights must be respected i don't think here in ghana we should get to the point where journalists can be picked up and tortured by national security these are things that happen in eritrea or somalia or um, the gambia under yaya jame and i think we've long gone past that state and so i was asking myself really um, is that what we've gotten ourselves into in terms of um, people not being pleased with whatever um, journalists may have done or even if journalists commit a crime um, is it is it the way to handle it? Uh, does is that how our laws prescribe the way we treat, you know, um, people who commit crimes, even if a journalist has published something that we are not happy about, or as they claim, um, if these journalists were uh, into activities of you know spying or whatever of other media organisations, which I don't believe. Now, the private newspaper publishers association, PrintPag, uh, has condemned the arrest and detention. I its president, Edwin Arthur, says that his outfit will use every means possible to get to the bottom of the issue. Let's uh, continue from the issue with national security. So currently, um, PrintPag has an issue with national security as to um, the manner in which two of our members who were arrested on Thursday and uh, released on Saturday, uh, the manner in which they were handled, uh, we are not happy. Uh, we've been hearing um, stories about the manner in which they were mishandled whilst in detention. We have not verified those uh, information. We haven't verified those facts. And so they, they remain allegations, they remain speculations. But we are making efforts, the leadership of Prempak is making frantic efforts to contact national security, especially the minister, because I personally spoke to the minister on Friday, and he gave me the assurance that our members were being treated very well. And so the, the, the stories that we are hearing, we are reading in, the, in, in some newspapers, uh, they are very unfortunate. But what, we, what are you hearing? Well, because we haven't verified. Mm -hmm. So they remain allegations, so I don't want to repeat them, but it borders on on mishandling of, of, of journalists in detention. But we haven't verified the facts, so I, would want, I wouldn't want to repeat that. I wouldn't want to put them out there. But we, will, we are making frantic effort in contacting the minister or his other officers. And then when we verify, Primpak will obviously issue a statement on it. But I want to believe that it is not true. But if it is true, then that was unfortunate. Is there any attempt by people in authority, say government officials, trying to make it impossible for journalists to operate uh, in, in a f a freely in Ghana? Well, there have been a few instances, but I want to believe that we as media practitioners have resisted the temptation. And I think that I must commend my, uh, my, my, my colleagues in the media for such a, a bravery because we have heard and seen attempts to intimidate journalists who were on certain beats, who were investigating uh, some stories. But they, they, they stuck to their, 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 their grounds and they completed them, uh, their investigation and they published their, their stories. And nothing happened to them. They, 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 they damned the, the consequences. And so, yes, there have been some attempts, but we have neutralized, uh, we as media practitioners, we have neutralized those, um, those, those moved by people, some from officialdom, some private persons. Uh, these things will continue to happen to us, but we will not be scared because we have a mandate given to us by the Constitution to prosecute. And that is exactly what we are going to do because we as the fourth, as members of the fourth estate of the realm, we have a responsibility and we can assure Ghanaians, we can ensure the, assure the whole world that we will not renege on our responsibility. We will do it and do it to the best of our abilities in the interest of Mother Ghana.
Now, National Security um, issued a statement uh, which we received this morning, and they vehemently refute uh, all of these accusations. I'll read through it very quickly. It says, the National Security Council Secretariat has taken notice of reports that Emmanuel Ajafo Abugri, one of the two suspects from modern Ghana who was arrested for engaging in cyber crimes, has made claims of being subjected to acts of torture whilst in the custody of its officers. The Secretariat takes a very serious view of these claims and wishes to state, in no uncertain terms, that these allegations are false. We consider it to be a clear and deliberate attempt by the suspect to discredit the investigations and the case against him. Torture and manhandling of suspects are not part and parcel of the culture and architecture of the Secretariat under the administration of President Ikufuado. We wish to categorically state that the suspect during questioning was never manhandled, neither was he subjected to any form of forced physical contact. The Secretariat is pleased to note that upon the suspect being handed over to the Criminal Investigation Department of the Ghana Police Service, the police has requested that a medical investigation of the suspect be undertaken immediately. We are confident that the results of the medical examination will present the truth in the matter, so as to inform the appropriate steps to be taken. In the meantime, the suspect will be arraigned before court on Tuesday, 2nd of July, 2019, and the charges preferred against him, I think it's proffered against him, will be made known. The Secretariat reassures the general public that it will, at all times, continue to respect the rule of law in all of its operations. And that is the statement from National Security in response to the allegations made by uh, one of the employees of ModernGhana.com, uh, a news portal, who claims that he was manhandled and tortured uh, under the custody of National Security operatives. Now, um, we need to understand some of the dimensions of, of what has happened. So, um, very quickly, we will um, speak to a lawyer who will help us understand uh, what ought to have happened at the time of the arrest of these two individuals, uh, and all that unfolded, whether any of it was lawful or not, uh, whether the statement issued by the National Security uh, Secretariat uh, indeed has any legal implications, uh, bearing in mind the fact that there will be a court case brought against these two suspects later today. In fact, we do have a law lecturer from GIMPA to help us uh, navigate some of these uh, issues. Dr. Isidore Tufo joins us on the line now. Doc, good morning and thank you for your time. Uh, good morning. Right, now Doc, uh, help us first of all understand the rules, the laws around arrest. National Security picked up these two individuals, we are told, uh, well at least by the individuals, that they, they had bags put over their heads and they were taken to a location that they did not know. But more importantly, no one else knew where they were. So um, they did not have access to any legal counsel because uh, nobody knew where they were. Uh, they were eventually released, uh, and upon their release, they are now making allegations of torture. Uh, I wonder if perhaps you could walk us through this and, and highlight for us all the legal uh, implications or the legal considerations that arise from, from this series of events. Good. Um, we have a process um, to go through when you have to effect a lawful arrest in this country. But in the country of law, you inform the person of the reason for arrest, and then you can take the person to your station or wherever you want to take the person for interrogation. But of course, the legal system guarantees some fundamental rights for the person who is suspected of having committed a criminal offense. Most important of all, informing the person of his right to counsel. That cannot be denied to any individual in this country. So to detain the person, taking the person, and torturing the person, which is just a violation, a violation of a fundamental human right in this country, is basically unacceptable. So some <coughs> of these things are not supposed to be to be done. If it's true that they were taken, that uh, they were not given access to counsel, that uh, they were taken some locations and they were tortured, then indeed I would say that very serious infringement on their fundamental human rights have been committed. Mm. Now, uh, Doc, also help us understand the role of national security here. Uh, because we heard that national security operatives were the ones who picked up uh, these individuals. Help us understand what sort of powers of arrest these national security operatives have. In fact, 
where are they mentioned in our penal code, for example, or in our laws? And what, what role is ascribed to them when it comes to arresting individuals suspected of crime? We have uh, um, the state government give some institutions in this country the power of arrest. So we have the police, we have institutions like um, the Economic and Organized um, Crime Office, we have uh, national security, we have uh, the Attorney General, for example, and officers, the Attorney General's office. They all have the power of arrest. So indeed, if a crime has been committed, that falls within their jurisdiction, the area of specialization in terms of crime investigation, they have the right to effect that, the, the power to effect that arrest. Mm. Uh, of course, arrest is arrest in this country. The procedure is, is governed by law. In all cases, you are not supposed to inflict any form of harm or use force when the person is not resistant. You still have to give the person the right to have access to counsel at all times, irrespective of the nature of the arrest or the invitation that you want to carry out. The person must have access to counsel. All the protection should be given. You know, so yes, they have the right to effect arrest, but must be done within the parameters set by law. So to be clear, their um, uh, um, authority to arrest doesn't fall under different parameters from the other institutions like the police and so forth. They no. they all no. fall under the same uh, uh, regulations. Yes. So we have the statute. The statute creating setting up these institutions give them the power of arrest, but. That power cannot be exercised outside the scope of the law. Within the, the power must be exercised within the parameters set by law. In other words, once you suspect a person of having committed a criminal thing, and as an institution you have been given the power of arrest, the person suspected to have committed the offense is protected by law. Mm. The first, giving the right to counsel, not torturing the person, using force only when the person is resisting arrest. You cannot secure any form of confession by using force. These are outdated models and practices mm. of, of criminal investigation. They are not done anywhere in this modern dispensation. Right. Now, yes. uh, uh, this arrest was uh, basically part of a raid of the, the offices of modern Ghana. Yes. Uh, uh, let's talk about that as well, the raiding of the office. Uh, uh, what, what are the legal... Uh, requirements that uh, a, a, an institution with the power of arrest like national security would have to go through before they can raid uh, private property? You know, actually, no, when you have to go in the, conduct some investigations, uh, it depends on the nature of the situation you are dealing with. Um, in case of emergency and looking at an institution like the national security, I will uh, be slow to say that they cannot without a warrant, get into some um, pre premises to conduct investigations or um, seize property. It, I mean, it depends on the nature of, 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 the, of, of, of the case at hand that they have to deal with. Um, ordinarily, you need a warrant to go to enter somebody's house and, and seize property or enter somebody's office and seize properties and all. You need a warrant to do that. But as I'm saying, this is a national security issue. In some cases, you have some urgent matters where they will need to just rush in there and do what they have to do. But mm -hmm. when that is not, there's no urgency, you know, then mm -hmm. you cannot arrogate yourself powers that amount to brutalities and, you know, sending us back into a um, mm -hmm. situation where let's, you, you get people to be afraid of what they have to do. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, let's uh, uh, create a scenario and then you can give me what your legal advice would be. So let's say your client is um, national security yeah. and uh, th their case is that well they suspected these individuals of uh, uh, being engaged in cyber crime that they were hacking into the systems of uh, other institutions including their competitors and for that reason you needed to um, you know arrest them and, and question them. Would, would you be able, as a lawyer, to convince a court that that fell under some form of emergency that would require a, a raid without a warrant? No. Taking it on the, on the face value like this, I, that, that will not qualify for that kind of emergency that I think, you know, that kind of urgent situation that will require an institution to use that kind of force and raise some institution. That will not be. But again, we have to also be mindful of the fact that you may not have all the facts because for now you are hearing from the journalists where the thing has been released. Mm. Um, the institution has not put out there any statement giving all the details. So 
again until we have the full fund. Normally, that will, will be will come from the two parties. Mm. You will not just rely on the statement or the fact from one of the parties to come to a conclusion. Mm. Yes. So we okay. have to hear from national security first, let them come out and give us all the details mm. and give us, you know, mm. what is it that warranted mm. the 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 push. All right. Uh, educate yeah. educate us on what is likely to happen in court. Uh, they are going to bring charges against these two individuals today. That's according to a statement that National Security has uh, issued. Now, uh, the fact that um, they were detained for a period of time without the knowledge of anybody, uh, including, uh, you would have to assume, their own legal counsel, since nobody knew where they were. Um, and uh, the, 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 the detail of their arrest as recounted by the, the, the two individuals. Um, taking those uh, facts for granted, would, would, could this affect the, the, the state's case against them in court? Unfortunately, um, no, because they are going to court preferring, preferring charges against this individual. So if they are able to establish the charges, the 11 against the accused person, the, the suspect for now, or until they go to court, if they are able to, let, to substantiate the charges against them, then there will be conviction. You understand? So that will yeah. not necessarily affect the trial. But their rights have been infringed upon, and they have to seek relief also. So if they were detained, they were not given access to counsel and all that, they have to make it known to the court. Now, unfortunately, um, the court will only regulate what uh, appears before them. That's from the time they, they walk into the courtroom and while trial is going on. The, the, it will be material if they are able to establish, for example, that at the time of the arrest, they were not given access to counsel. They were not informed of their right to counsel. In that case, a statement elicited from them may not be used against them because they become somehow invalidated by, by the violations of their human rights. So that's as far as it can go. If they have been detained for more than 48 hours, that would be um, from them, the accused person, or for now the suspect, to bring an action against the institution for violating their rights. Right, but it, it would not affect the material facts of uh, whichever case is brought against them. Uh, no, it will not affect the material facts in respect of the court case itself unless it is established, for example, that the right, the violation has an impact on some statements they made, right. in which case they will not be admissible, or that they were not given their right to counsel, and there was nobody that present at the time statements were taken, in which case those statements will not be admissible. Right, well, so that... To the, to the extent that you have a violation of a human right within the fair trial right, mm. which affects any statement made, then the statement will not be admissible. Very good. Th this has been very useful, Dr. Tufo. Uh, we appreciate your time with us very much. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Isidore Tufo, a law lecturer from Gimpa.